Ryan Bland. I'm here from the City of Aiken Planning Department and just thought I would um, speak a little bit about our department and how we might be able to help you as the public. So, uh, first question is what do we do? We facilitate the creation of and the implementation of the city's comprehensive plan. So that's number one. Uh, we coordinate development review to implement the comprehensive plan. That includes implementing zoning ordinance, so rezoning, subdivision of land, uh, signage, certificates of appropriateness, which are required in our historic district and our uh, old Aiken overlay district. Uh, we handle those as well. So those are the kind of day-to-day -day permitting processes that people might be um, needing to go through that come through our office. And then we also, a, uh, as a department, a liaison to the city council, the planning commission, the board of zoning appeals, and the design review board here in the city of Aiken uh, regarding land use entitlement processes and the development process and future plans for the city. So city council makes the ultimate decisions. Uh, the planning commission makes recommendations on mostly zoning matters and matters related to the comprehensive plan. They make recommendations to the city council. The board of zoning appeals hears variances and special exceptions and appeals of my decision. So if there's something in the code that you don't think I'm interpreting correctly, you have an appeal to that and that design review board, I mean the uh, board of zoning appeals is who, who does that. Uh, variances is if you have a hardship on your property, you have something related to your property that's unique enough that you need relief from it, that board can decide on those matters. And uh, the um, special exception process in our code, there are certain uses that are allowed kind of no matter, not really no matter what, but uh, most of the time in each zone district, a special exception is something that requires a little more scrutiny. So uh, that goes through the design, I mean, the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals for a special exception, and they just kind of look to make sure it's not in conflict with the comprehensive plan and things like that. And the Design Review Board oversees our historic district and our uh, old Aiken overlay district. So they're, they're, they look at changes to uh, visible changes that you can see from the right of way. Uh, they review those to make sure they're appropriate before construction can be done. And some of those can be done administratively, some of those can be done by going to the full board. Some things don't require certificate at all. Um, so um, now, why might you be interested in talking with a planner, either myself or from our department? Um, you may want to build something yourself on your property. Uh, we ask you to please start by talking to us and make sure it's sited properly on there. So there's kind of two sides of it. One is the, uh, um, the building side of it and one is the zoning side of it. The zoning side of it is mostly where it's located, how large it is, that sort of thing. The building side of it is, is the nuts and bolts of how it gets put together. Um, so that's the primary reason a homeowner would come see us. Uh, you also may want to ask about nearby development. I always, uh, as people are either looking at property or if they own property, um, if you want to know what's going on, if there's any, any future plans around that property or your property, please come see us. That's, uh, I'm, I'm in the process of buying a home right now, and that's one of those things that I <laughs> um, have learned to look at, is what, what are the plans around that area? Is there anything, is there anything entitled me? Does anybody have the right to build something on a vacant piece of property around you? Um, are there other uses that uh, have the right to expand, or what's the process for that if they're kind of something you're concerned about? that's um, a good idea to come talk to us. Uh, you may want to participate in future plans for the city. So we do occasionally, um, per state code and good policy, uh, update our comprehensive plan, update uh, our policies, procedures, zoning ordinances. So uh, we always um, would, would like participation in that to get feedback. Um, uh, we work for the city council who works for you. So uh, we, want to make sure that the interest of the public and what we do um, is, is, is the utmost priority. And we would like to think that, some, that you may even want to serve on one of our boards or commissions. Again, we have uh, three commissions that we run, or that we um, are a liaison to, the primary liaison to, the secretary to as a, as a department. So that's the Design Review Board, the Board of Zoning Appeals, and the Planning Commission. And we're always looking for good people to serve on those, as well as a number of other committees of the city. But those are the primary ones that we deal with. Uh, some helpful resources I think that would be um, good to, for us to promote. Uh, if you go to, the, now these are all kind of under the same heading. If you go to our city website, uh, cityofaconsc.gov, and you go to the heading services, the first thing is this mapping. And under that mapping heading, there, there's one that says zoning, there's one that says, there's, uh, I think, council districts. Um, the mapping one will take you to this, the zoning one. And 
and you can't really see it on here, but on that right hand side, you have everything from zoning. You can see where our sewer lines are, where our water lines are. Um, you can see what nearby zoning is, and that might not tell you a lot, but generally, you know, it's going to tell you. You're going to be able to figure out whether it's residential, whether it's commercial, and then you know, it's a, it's, it's a good tool in that sense to be able to kind of, um, again, as you're you know, looking at property, you're looking around your neighborhood and, and, and what could possibly change in your neighborhood, look at the map, figure out what the uses are that people can change, uh, you know, do different sorts of development or, or change, uh, make changes to their properties. Um, you can go to, under the heading read to the zoning ordinance. Now it's a real page turner, um, but <laughs> with, with, with the help, <laughs> uh, I will say this, it, um, most of the sections of our code are written fairly a lot of the use tables and things like that are in a table format. So you can see, here's what the uses are, here's what's permitted, and it's pretty easy to follow if you know where to look. So that's, uh, we'll get to that a little bit. The other thing that people are interested in often with our department is under the apply sign up, we have our water sewer annexation policy. So our water sewer annexation policy basically says that if you are continuing, if you're outside the city limits, but that property is contiguous to the city limits, meaning I'm either directly across the street for a property or I'm butting a property that's in the city, then if that property has water and sewer access, upon change of ownership, it has to be annexed into the city, or at least has to at least apply, and then you can make a case before city council, city council ultimately decides on the annexations. But again, if it's right on the edge of the city, if it's on the periphery, it's in the donut hole, if, there, if, it's, if it's at least one side of it is touching another property or directly across the street from a property uh, that is in the city limits and has water and sewer, it's required to annex. That, and so, being able to force people to do that. right, and so in in one sense, if it's just strictly, if you're talking strictly annexation, yes, but this is tied to the city's, so the city's the purveyor of the water and the sewer in this case, okay. and that is where legally you can require people to annex if they're adjacent to your city limits. Okay. So there is, I mean, it, just in the general sense, yeah. most times you cannot force somebody to annex. Now there are some. Um, area annexation, so like an old neighborhood, um, it takes, I think, 75% of property owners and 75% of the valuation. You, uh, if, if those, that number of people sign a petition and it goes to city council, they can choose to take in a whole area. Okay. But at, at an individual properties, um, without this water sewer provision, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it's water and sewer, there's, there's actually not a lot, a lot of properties out there that have both water and sewer and outside of the city. I mean, there's a few, um, most of them are in donut holes, but um, uh, it, it's, yeah, I want to say, in the 200 something range of properties, which, you know, there's over, I think, a few thousand properties in our water district. So it's, anyway, that's the method of, of how that. that yeah, I don't want to take up all your time. No. I remember looking at the uh, the map one day. I came across it on what's city and what's not. And it's mm -hmm. like all over the place. And I'm assuming places like Woodside and Cedar Creek, because there were big developments, they were required to be part of the city. And that's why there's so many strange, not real, right. no real. This is the city. Yeah. So again, it kind of it kind of follows where, and so a lot of the times it's tied to sewer. So Cedar Creek, for instance, isn't in the city. It's actually in the county. Oh. The Woodside is, and so Cedar Creek doesn't have our sewer. Okay. Uh, Woodside does, mm -hmm. and so the way sewer engineering works, it doesn't necessarily follow <laughs> rectangles. It follows topography and things like that more so. The engineering of it does, and so that's why you kind of end up with some odd shapes, and that's a lot, really, a lot of times tied to where you can engineer sewer for a, a group of properties at the same time. Okay. Now we do have a number of of, of property like uh, subdivisions um, that you'll find outside the city. Um, uh, Summer Lake comes to mind, I think, that, that uh, the whole subdivision was built and entered into an annexation agreement as a subdivision with the city that says, it, and that's because they, they get city water, that says if, if and when the city ever reaches, the boundary ever reaches that far out and we provide sewer, then you're required to annex. Okay. Um, and so there's a number of those agreements floating around. You'll find them on properties, and a lot of times you have to. Um, you, 
if you don't have an agreement and somebody's buying a new property that doesn't already have an agreement and has water service with the city, uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll uh, most of the time you'll be required to enter into one of those annexation agreements. But again, that depends on us being able to provide sewer to that property. So. Okay, thank you. I have a very small, quick question. Uh, Dylan Falls, how does this come to, to be? Is that similar kind of situation? With Right, so sometimes donut holes formed um, just because, again, yeah, water and sewer could like kind of form around, you know, they were harder to service as an area. Sometimes they were a group that did do have city services, uh, particularly the ones you see in like Jim Lakes and uh, a few like in, 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 in that area where there's single unit donut holes or a couple units. Those were actually just conscious council decisions at the time that people, as part of that kind of a petition process, there was a number of people who stepped forward and said, I don't want to be annexed, and that city council was sympathetic to that at the time and, and, and didn't require annexation. So, um, uh, Doherty Road, for instance, though, is mostly in the county, uh, and it's kind of completely encircled by the city, right? Um, and it's because of one, the sewer lines only go so far. So, I think it's right behind here. Right yeah, the area right behind here. Now, the area right behind here does have water and sewer, but it was not required to annex at the time. So that that is the area, the neighborhood directly behind here. Yeah, uh, they have a lot of those have been as, and a lot of those were built actually on septic systems, mm -hmm. and so the city provided sewer, but did not require them to connect at the time. But as those sewer systems fail, uh, the septic systems fail. DHEC has been requiring them to heck hook onto the city prop, city um, lines, and that will force annexation. So. So just because it's not a septic system doesn't, it, you know, it, it, it kind of buy you time if there's a, a sewer line in front of you, but if that ever fails, typically you, yeah, you, you, you'll usually have to hook on from DHEC. Um, and basically, and that's to promote um, a better groundwater. They want us to provide a central sewer system as far as we can um, and then promote people to hook on to that. Um, now, again, it, um, this kind of gets back to the zoning works, but just a number of things. Contact us. We, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, contact us, and, and 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 we can talk through specific property situations with you, development situations, future plans for the city. We're always glad. Here, I'll put it. I think I have another one. Here we go. I got a bottom slide where it's larger, um, and uh, we're at the municipal building, which is on Park Avenue between Lawrence and um, Newberry, uh, right next to Mellow Mushroom. We're on the second floor right outside the city council chamber. So if you ever need to come talk to us, see, so we're gonna do that fairly quickly. I got about five minutes. Um, so I can either, well, I'll go ahead and do this. I, I, I had the top five planning questions we receive on residential property. So I thought I'd go over those real quick. Here we go. Um, fence regulations. This is kind of number one. Everybody has to do some of the fence at some point, it seems like. Um, those can be six feet behind the house, behind the front plane of the house. It's eight feet if you're against a non-residential property. So if you're abutting a non-residential property, you can have an eight foot fence. In the front yard, you can have a four foot, the front plane of the house forward, a four foot fence. All right. In the historic district, um, this is kind of due to the historic development patterns. You can have up to 12 feet, but that has to get a certificate of appropriateness from the design review board. So while it caps out at 10 feet, what the design review board will do, they'll look at properties around you, look at your situation, um, you know, kind of whether you need some privacy for a pool or things like that, and kind of try to work with you to make a determination on what appropriate height it is. So it's, it's not like somebody's typically wouldn't allow just like a, you know, like a four foot fence here and a 12 foot fence here. Um, it's got to be kind of contextual. And then, um, kind of, yeah, we have to, on a corner, we have to maintain corner visibility. So we have specific requirements that we have to be able to, for that, you know, those folks that are stopped or having to look out for traffic. Um, we have some special provisions to make sure we have corner visibility. And that, that's a window between three foot and seven foot that we have to keep open. Um, accessory structures, we get this a lot too. Um, again, they kind of have to be in the rear side yards. Uh, they can't be the total of all accessory buildings. Yes. Question about corner visibility. There's several intersections in Aiken where you cannot see without pulling halfway into the intersection. Who do we report those to to get the safety issue taken care of? Uh, it kind of depends what it is. If it's a private property, then we would be looking at that from the zoning side of things. 
Um, typically, public safety is a good place to start as well. I mean, we, um, so you can either kind of start with them or with us. We work with a lot of times we get within our parkways as well. So we'll we'll work with the city horticulturist and his team um, to kind of remediate some of those situations. Sometimes it's yeah, we just haven't you know got, that hasn't been on the schedule for you know we're supposed to get out there in the next week or so. Sometimes it's yeah more a chronic situation. So. It's one, of the, it's one of those things, a lot of those are also, unfortunately, kind of legacy situations that are kind of put in before this type of provision was put in place. So, again, to kind of depend on the level of... of, of and what it is. And what it is, yeah. If it's yeah. a shed or if it's a bush, you know, it makes a difference of where it goes. Right. So, so yeah. Specifically behind Hardee's. Okay. When you come out from oh, Home Depot, sure. there's no way you can see without pulling halfway into the intersection. And now I think there's a big pothole there too, so you got to be careful you don't disappear in that. <laughs> but that's not your area. <laughs> but, I mean, it really is bad behind Cardi. I agree. I turn down there all the time. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to figure that specific situation. I've not been back there in a little while, but is it is a tree? Is it it's a shrub? I think. Is it a shrub? Yeah. Okay. So if it's a shrub or something like that, we can yeah we can address that. So but a lot of times, I mean we. We do have our zoning officials, so we have zoning officials that, that are out on patrol on, on, a, on a daily basis. A number of times they're on, on complaints and things like that, but you know when they have time, we try to have them proactively look at things, and so yeah, sometimes we'll find things like that, and sometimes, but it helps if they're brought to our attention. So we can have a guy, we have one of our guys take a look at that. So, um, the accessory buildings, 50% of the gross floor area of your house, and you can divide that up amongst one building, two buildings, three buildings. It has to be in the rear side yard. It has to be at least 10 feet from a rear side property line. So if you're on a corner lot, it can't be any further out from the house than the, than the plane of the house. There's a, a setback line. In our code, if you have a corner property, you can consider to have two front yards. Um, and that's to kind of maintain, again, some of the visibility along, along there and, and continuity with where the, the building code is. Now, uh, we don't require you to have a rear yard. We, we count these as two side yards. So if you, you have a little more flexibility on one side but not on the other. Um, and then pools are accessory structures and are not accessory buildings, so they're not subject to that 50% rule. So you can have 50%, a lot of people have taken advantage of this for a, um, you know, like a garage or a pool house or something like that, where you can make a fairly large pool house and have a pool. Um, the mother-in-law unit, the accessory dwelling unit, um, again, they have to be in the rear or side yards. They can't be any more than 35% of the floor area of the primary residence. But if you're, we have some minimum lot sizes, um, they uh, are allowed by right in a lot of residential districts, which is kind of unique. It does have to be 10 feet from the rear or side property line and it has to be one of the units. This is kind of interesting. One of the units has to be owner-occupied. Um, and, you know, you can choose to live in the mother-in-law unit and rent out the primary unit. We have that happen occasionally. We allow that flexibility. Um, recreational vehicle regulations. These come up a lot with us in the zoning side. You're allowed three on a residential lot under the following conditions. On an interior lot means that you're surrounded on one side, uh, on, on all sides by other residences. Um, it has to be in the rear side yard. It can't be any further forward than the front plan of the house. Uh, on a corner lot, if it it can be in the rear side yard, but if it's in the side yard on that street side, it's got to be screened in some way. It says by evergreen vegetation, um, but we can also look at some alternative methods. Sometimes it's you know a privacy fence. There's there's different kind of ways we can we can work on that depending on what the situation is. But so there are some special provisions on a side yard. Um, we've also had some situations where essentially what we're trying to do is it, or what the code is trying to do with what the council establishes that all, mostly what you would see is the front of, a, of an RV so we've had other alternative situations where like maybe somebody has an accessory building back here and they'll park it long ways next to it so you're still just seeing the front of the unit so we can work with you on those corner lots they're a little more tricky um, out in front of the house uh, you, you can only park for 24 hours for the purpose of loading Again, if that's an issue, come talk to us. We can kind of work with you to make sure uh, that we meet the, the requirement of that. But it can't be used for permanent habitation, except for two consecutive weeks a year, two consecutive weeks in any calendar year. So if you have somebody come stay at your house, there's, there's kind of a two-week provision. Somebody can't stay there for a brief amount of time. Uh, home business regulations, real quickly. Um, yeah, we're starting to wrap up here. You have to have an annual business license. It, it uh, must be, um, 
in the principal dwelling. It's, it's not supposed to be operated out of an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, it can't be more than 25% of your home dedicated toward the, the home office. It has to be secondary to the residence. Basically, this is trying to protect the residence as a residence first and the, and the home business second instead of vice versa. Um, can't impact the residential character, so increases in traffic, and clutter, and noise, those sorts of things. Um, can't disturb others around you. And kind of that threshold, and this is kind of established administratively um, through a number of decisions that 20 minutes a week roughly is, is kind of that threshold before you move into a larger scale business that would have to be offsite. Um, again, get into specifics of that, let us know. No employees um, can be part of this, so you can't have anybody come to your house unless you get a special exception, you can have one. So occasionally we have somebody who has a home office that has an administrative staff that comes to their home. Um, you have to get a special exception from the BZA, you know, a special exception just kind of proves no harm um, as part of this. So, it, you know, just one person coming is kind of generally seen as that's not going to, you know, be a major issue. A lot of these are, again, mostly administrative function types of uh, businesses. Um, and then you can have a little one and a half square foot sign that has some down on the house. Um, the only thing I'll say about our historic overlay districts and old Lake overlay districts, again, if you are um, in that area and you have a, uh, a property change you want to make, change that you can see from the right of way, come see us. Um, there's a scale of it, 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 there's a scale of properties on there from landmark to contributing to non-contributing. Non-contributing properties typically are like 50s ranch homes, things like that. They got built kind of after the, the winter colony era. A lot of things can be done those um, without a lot of uh, a lot of hoops to jump through, so to speak. Um, the, the contributing properties are better, um, have, a, have a checklist of items that would have to either come to the board or can be approved administratively. So um, the, when I say approved administratively, we still look at it, it's just myself and the design review board chair. You don't have to come stand before a board and make your case on those items. And most of those items, there, there are a lot of items that you can do administratively. So I, I want to let people know that they shouldn't be scared off by, by, by that process. It's just to make sure that the character of the district is maintained. Um, and a lot of people, you know, if you're buying in that area, you're cognizant of that. So, um, and, you know, protects you and it protects your neighbors. And the, and the city's history. Probably the banks, yeah, that was, that was a nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great building. And, I was trying to think of like, what, what can I put up here that's not somebody's house or the Wilcox? I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll throw the museum up. <laughs> so again, um, yeah, if, if, you have, if you need to get a hold of us, um, uh, stop by the planning office. I have my cards here I can leave um, in the back of the room. And um, yeah, be, be glad to talk with anybody anytime about anything zoning related, planning, future plans for the city, things you read in the newspaper. Uh, we're always glad to discuss that with folks and, and try to get people involved in the planning effort. So appreciate it.